The Evil of Sin Works for Good to the Godly by Thomas Watson The writings of Thomas Watson are perhaps the most approachable for the modern reader of the Puritans. The following is an excerpt from A Divine Cordial, which is published by Banner of Truth Trust under the title All Things for Good. No other exposition on Romans 8.28 is so soothing a balm for the suffering saint. Editor Sin in its own nature is damnable, but God in his infinite wisdom overrules it and causes good to arise from that which seems most to oppose it. Indeed, it is a matter of wonder that any honey should come out of this lion. We may understand it in a double sense. Number one, the sins of others are overruled for good to the godly. It is no small trouble to a gracious heart to live among the wicked. Woe is me that I dwell in Masech, Psalm 120, verse 5. Yet even this the Lord turns to good. For, first, the sins of others work for good to the godly as they produce holy sorrow. God's people weep for what they cannot reform. Rivers of tears run down my eyes because they keep not thy law, Psalm 119, verse 136. David was a mourner for the sins of the times. His heart was turned into a spring and his eyes into rivers. Wicked men make merry with sin. When thou doest evil, when thou rejoicest. Jeremiah 11, verse 15. But the godly are weeping doves. They grieve for the oaths and blasphemies of the age. The sins of others, like spears, pierce their souls. This grieving for the sins of others is good. It shows a childlike heart to resent with sorrow the injuries done to our Heavenly Father. It also shows a Christ-like heart. He was grieved for the hardness of their hearts. Mark 3, verse 5. The Lord takes special notice of these tears. He likes it well that we should weep when His glory suffers. It argues more grace to grieve for the sins of others than for our own. We may grieve for our own sins out of fear of hell, but to grieve for the sins of others is from a principle of love to God. These tears drop as water from the roses. They are sweet and fragrant, and God puts them in his bottle. Second, the sins of others work for good to the godly as they set them the more a praying against sin. If there were not such a spirit of wickedness abroad, perhaps there would not be such a spirit of prayer. Crying sins cause crying prayers. The people of God pray against the iniquity of the times that God will give a check to sin that he will not, or that he will put sin to the blush. If they cannot pray down sin, they pray against it, and this God takes kindly. These prayers shall both be recorded and rewarded. Though we do not prevail in prayer, we shall not lose our prayers. My prayer returned into mine own bosom. Psalm 35, verse 13. Thirdly, the sins of others work for good as they make us the more in love with grace. The sins of others are a foil to set off the luster of grace the more. One contrary sets off another. Deformity sets off beauty. The sins of the wicked do much disfigure them. Pride is a disfiguring sin. Now the beholding another's pride makes us the more in love with humility. Malice is a disfiguring sin. It is the devil's picture. The more of this we see in others, the more we love meekness and charity. Drunkenness is a disfiguring sin. It turns men into beasts. It deprives of the use of reason. The more intemperate we see others, the more we must love sobriety. The black face of sin sets off the beauty of holiness so much the more. Fourthly, the sins of others work for good as they work in us the stronger opposition against sin. The wicked have made void thy law, therefore I love thy commandments. Psalm 119 verses 126 through 127. David had never loved God's law so much if the wicked had not set themselves so much against it. 
The more violent others are against the truth, the more valiant the saints are for it. Living fish swim against the stream. The more tide of sin comes in, the more the godly swim against it. The impieties of the times provoke holy passions in the saints. That anger is without sin, which is against sin. The sins of others are as a whetstone to set the sharper edge upon us. They whet our zeal and indignation against sin the more. Fifthly, the sins of others work for good as they make us more earnest in working out our salvation. When we see wicked men take such pains for hell, this makes us more industrious for heaven. The wicked have nothing to encourage them, yet they sin. They venture shame and disgrace. They break through all opposition. Scripture is against them, and conscience is against them. There is a flaming sword in the way, yet they sin. Godly hearts, seeing the wicked thus mad for the forbidden fruit and wearing out themselves in the devil's service, are the more emboldened and quickened in the ways of God. They will take heaven, as it were, by storm. The wicked are swift dromedaries in sin, Jeremiah 2, verse 23. And do we creep like snails in religion? Shall impure sinners do the devil more service than we do for Christ? Shall they make more haste to a prison than we do to the kingdom? Are they never weary of sinning, and are we weary of praying? Have we not a better master than they? Are not the paths of virtue pleasant? Is not their joy in the way of duty in heaven at the end? The activity of the sons of Belial in sin is a spur to the godly to make them mend their pace and run faster to heaven. Sixthly, the sins of others work for good, as they are glasses in which we may see our own hearts. Do we see a flagitious, impious sinner? Behold, a picture of our hearts. Should such we be, if God did leave us? What is in other men's practice is in our nature. Sin in the wicked is like fire on a beacon that flames and blazes forth. Sin in the godly is like fire in the embers. Christian, though you do not break forth into a flame of scandal, yet you have no cause to boast, for there is much sin raked up in the embers of your nature. You have the root of bitterness in you, and would bear as hellish fruit if any, or as any, if God did not either curb you by his power, or change you by his grace. Seventh, the sins of others work for good, as they are the means of making the people of God more thankful. When you see another infected with the plague, how thankful are you that God has preserved you from it? It is a good use that may be made of the sins of others to make us more thankful. Why might not God have left us to the same excess of riot? Think with yourself, O Christian, why should God be more propitious to you than to another? Why should he take you out of the wild olive of nature and not him? How may this make you to adore free grace? What the Pharisee said boastingly, we may say thankfully, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, etc. Luke 18, verse 11. So we should adore the riches of grace that we are not as others, drunkards, swearers, Sabbath breakers. Every time we see men hasting in on sin, or hasting on in sin, we are to bless God we are not such. If we see a frenzied person, we bless God it is not so with us. Much more when we see others under the power of Satan, we should make our thankful acknowledgement that it is not our condition. Let us not think lightly of sin.
8th. The sins of others work for good, as they are means of making God's people better. Christian, God can make you a gainer by another's sin. The more unholy others are, the more holy you should be. The more a wicked man gives himself to sin, the more a godly man gives himself to prayer. But I give myself to prayer. Psalm 109 verse 4. Ninth. The sins of others work for good, as they give an occasion to us of doing good. Were there no sinners, we could not be in such a capacity for service. The godly are often the means of converting the wicked. Their prudent advice and pious example is a lure and a bait to draw sinners to the embracing of the gospel. The disease of the patient works for the good of the physician by emptying the patient of noxious humors. The physician enriches himself. So, by converting sinners from the error of their way, our crown comes to be enlarged. They that turn many to righteousness shall shine as the stars forever and ever. Daniel 12, verse 3. Not as lamps or tapers, but as the stars forever. Thus we see the sins of others are overruled for our good. Number two. The sense of their own sinfulness will be overruled for the good of the godly. Thus our own sins shall work for good. This must be understood warily when I say, the sins of the godly work for good, not that there is the least good in sin. Sin is like poison which corrupts the blood, infects the heart, and, without a sovereign antidote, brings death. Such is the venomous nature of sin. It is deadly and damning. Sin is worse than hell, but yet God, by his mighty overruling power, makes sin in the issue turn to the good of his people. Hence that golden saying of Augustine, God would never permit evil if he could not bring good out of evil. The, sin, or the feeling of sinfulness in the saints works for good in several ways. First, sin makes them weary of this life. That sin is in the godly is sad, but that it is a burden is good. Paul's afflictions, pardon the expression, were but a play to him in comparison of his sin. He rejoiced in tribulation, 2 Corinthians 7 verse 4. But how did this bird of paradise weep and bemoan himself under his sins? Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Romans 7.24 A believer carries his sins as a prisoner his shackles. Oh, how does he long for the day of release? And this sense of sin is good. Second, this in being of corruption makes the saints prize Christ more. He that feels his sin as a sick man feels his sickness. How welcome is Christ the physician to him. He that feels himself stung with sin. How precious is the brazen serpent to him. When Paul has cried out of a body of death, how thankful was he for Christ. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, Romans 7.25. Christ's blood saves from sin and is the sacred ointment which kids this quicksilver. Third, this sense of sin works for good as it is an occasion of putting the soul upon six special duties. Letter A. It puts the soul upon self-searching. A child of God, being conscious of sin, takes the cradle and lantern of the word and searches into his heart. He desires to know the worst of himself as a man who is diseased in body, desires to know the worst of his disease. Though our joy lies in the knowledge of our graces, yet there is some benefit in the knowledge of our corruptions. Therefore Job prays, Make me to know my transgressions, Job 13 verse 23. It is good to know our sins that we may not flatter ourselves or take our condition to be better than it is. 
It is good to find out our sins, lest they find us out. Letter B. The inheritance or the inheritance of sin puts a child of God upon self abasing. Sin is left in a godly man as a cancer in the breast or a hunch upon the back to keep him from being proud. Gravel and dirt are good to ballast a ship and keep it from overturning. The sense of sin helps to ballast the soul, that it be not overturned with vain glory. We read of the spots of God's children, Deuteronomy 32, verse 5. When a godly man beholds his face in the glass of Scripture and sees the spots of infidelity and hypocrisy, this makes the plumes of pride fall. They are humbling spots. It is a good use that may be made even of our sins when they occasion low thoughts of ourselves. Better is that sin which humbles me than that duty which makes me proud. Holy Bradford uttered these words of himself, I am a painted hypocrite. And Hooper said, Lord, I am hell, and thou art heaven. Letter C. Sin puts a child of God on self-judging. He passes a sentence upon himself. I am more brutish than any man. Proverbs 30, verse 2. It is dangerous to judge others, but it is good to judge ourselves. If we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 31. When a man has judged himself, Satan is put out of office. When he lays anything to a saint's charge, he is able to retort and say, It is true, Satan, I am guilty of these sins, but I have judged myself already for them. And having condemned myself in the lower court of conscience, God will acquit me in the upper court of heaven. Letter D. Sin puts a child of God upon self-conflicting. Spiritual self conflicts with carnal self. The spirit lusts against the flesh. Galatians 5 verse 17. Our life is a wayfaring life and a warfaring life. There is a duel fought every day between the two seeds. A believer will not let sin have peaceable possession. If he cannot keep sin out, he will keep sin under, though he cannot quite overcome yet he is overcoming. To him that is overcoming. Revelation 2 verse 7. Letter E. Sin puts a child of God upon self-observing. He knows sin is a bosom traitor, therefore he carefully observes himself. A subtle heart needs a watchful eye. The heart is like a castle that is in danger every hour to be assaulted. This makes a child of God to be always a sentinel, and to keep a guard about his heart. A believer has a strict eye over himself, lest he fall into any scandalous enormity, and so open a slice to let, out, to let all his comfort run out. Letter F. Sin puts the soul upon self-reforming. A child of God does not only find out sin, but drives out sin. One foot he sets upon the neck of his sins, and the other foot he turns to God's testimonies. Psalm 119, verse 59. Thus the sins of the godly work for good. God makes the saints' maladies their medicines. But, len, but let none abuse this doctrine. I do not say that sin works for good to an impenitent person. No, it works for his damnation but it works for good to them that love God, and for you that are godly, I know you will not draw a wrong conclusion from this, either to make light of sin or to make bold with sin. If you should do so, God will make it cost you dearly. Remember David. He ventured presumptuously on sin, and what did he get? He lost his peace. He felt the terrors of the Almighty in his soul though he had all helps to cheerfulness. He was a king. He had skill in music, yet nothing could administer comfort to him. He complains of his broken bones, Psalm 51, verse 8. 
and though he did at last come out of that dark cloud, yet some divines are of opinion that he never recovered his full joy to his dying day. If any of God's people should be tampering with sin, because God can turn it to good, though the Lord does not damn them, he may send them to hell in this life. He may put them into such bitter agonies and soul convulsions as may fill them full of horror and make them draw near to despair. Let this be a flaming sword to keep them from coming near the forbidden tree. And thus I have shown that both the best things and the worst things by the overruling hand of the great God do work together for the good of the saints. Again I say, think not lightly of sin.